Okay, this is chapter 14. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. This is infection and human immunodeficiency virus infection. Um, let's see if I can get my screen to uh, roll here. So let's start with some definitions. Uh, infection can be divided into a couple of different areas. We have localized, which is limited to a small area. We have disseminated infection that has spread to areas beyond uh, areas of the body beyond the initial site of infection, and we have systemic infection, which is spread extensively throughout the body. Um, we have different types of pathogens, and some of the more common ones are bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, and prions. Um, there's a couple of ways we look at things um, and try and diagnose. So we might do a laboratory assessment. Um, we would do a culture and antibiotic sensitivity, a CNS. We would look at a CBC to see how the body's trying to fight it. We would do an erythrocyte sedimentation rate or a sed rate. We could do serological testing and we could do imaging. Infection, um, healthcare associated infections, HCIs. Um, what can I say? Hand hygiene, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Um, we want the antibacterial soap in the hospitals, and if you can't do that, use the um, alcohol based um, hand sanitizers. Um, OSHA, the Occupational Health Safety and Health Administration guidelines wants us to wash our hands, wash our hands, wash our hands. We have several types of infection precautions. Know your standard precautions. Um, know your transmission-based precautions. Those are droplet precautions um, for influenza and pertussis. We are in influenza season right now. Airborne precautions uh, for tuberculosis and rubiola and contact precautions for MRSA, MRSA and VRE. Um, and there are a couple of antibiotic resistant organisms we need to talk about. We have methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus MRSA. Um, that has morphed twice. We now have healthcare associated methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus HA MRSA and community acquired methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, CA MRSA. Um, it is a strong little critter. We all also have vancomycin resistant enter enterococci, VRE, and we have penicillin resistant Streptococcus pneumonia. Um, you see on this slide, the last line, it says no table 14 7. Um, need I say more? No table 14 7. All right, so let's talk about um, human immunodeficiency virus infection. HIV is a retrovirus that causes immunosuppression, making persons more susceptible to infections. Greater than 1 million currently living in HIV, with HIV in the world. About 50,000 new infections occur in the United States each year. Effective treatment has led to a significant drop in death rates. Um, those are in, uh, that drop is in the, uh, not in the third world countries. That's in the, the where we have good health care. Transmission of HIV, it's, contract, it's transmitted through contact of certain body fluids, blood, semen, vaginal secretions, and breast milk. It's not spread through casual contact, hugging, dry kissing, shaking hands, sharing eating utensils, using toilet seats. It's not spread through tears, saliva, urine, emesis, sputum, feces, sweat, respiratory droplets, or enteric routes. 
Again, it's transmitted through contact with certain body fluids, those fluids, blood, semen, vaginal secretions, and breast milk. Unprotected sex with an HIV-infected partner is the most common mode of transmission. The greatest risk is for the partner who, re who receives semen. There's also a greater risk for the person that has prolonged contact with infected fluids. Women are at higher risk, and any type of trauma increases likelihood of transmission. Again, coming in contact with blood, sharing drug using paraphernalia is highly risky. Screening measures have improved blood supply safety. We like that. Puncture wounds are the most common means of work-related HIV transmission. Even with that, um, the risk of con uh, uh, contracting HIV through a um, needle stick is low. Perinatal transmission. This can occur during pregnancy, delivery, or breastfeeding. An average of 25% of infants born to women with untreated HIV will contract the infection. That's 25% of infants for untreated HIV. If the female has treatment, that rate can be reduced to less than 2%. That's good news. If the, the pregnant mom is treated, is receiving treatment for HIV, the transmission is less than 2%. That's important to know. The pathophysiology of HIV, um, it is a retrovirus. It targets the CD4 plus T cell. It's a type of lymphocyte. The HIV binds to the cell through fusion. The immune problem starts when the CD4 plus T count drops below 500 cells. Severe problems start when the count drops below 200. A normal range is 800 to 1200. Insufficient immune responses allow for opportunistic diseases and that's when the patient runs into trouble. This slide shows um, a timeline, and uh, this is for untreated HIV infection. And if you notice in, uh, at the bottom, um, we have acute and chronic, and then above that, we have zero to 12 months, and then we switch over to years. And it basically goes from one, uh, well, zero to 13 years. So this timeline is saying that the uh, typical lifespan for untreated um, HIV is zero to 13 years. It's different for treated HIV. That is changing all the time. All right, so symptomatic infections. This is a picture of oral thrush. Isn't that lovely? Um, imagine how that feels. That's a, a candidal infection of the mouth. Other complications that we might see. Um, uh, HIV patients are prone to shingles. They're prone to persistent vaginal candidal infections, to herpes, and bacterial infections, frequent bacterial infections. This is all because the immune system is suppressed. It cannot fight back. Um, Kaposi sarcoma is an opportunity cancer, opportunistic cancer that tends to jump on board. This is what it looks like. Oral hairy leukoplakia is an Epstein-Barr virus infection um, that causes these white, uh, painless ray, uh, raised uh, lesions on the tongue. This is another indicator. So clinical uh, manifestations and complications for AIDS. The diagnostic criteria is established by the CDC. Um, this means the immune system is severely compromised. Remember, it's less than 200 um, cells. Uh, we see infections, we see malignancies, we see wasting, and we see HIV-related cognitive changes. This is a picture of pneumocystic Yerovecchia pneumonia, and this is the most common pneumonia that um, we see with um, AIDS patients that come in. 
Uh, most of the time they're going to be in a critical care unit because they are that sick. Um, so here's a question for you. Um, is this type of pneumonia um, at risk for the healthcare worker? Probably not unless in some way you're immunosuppressed. And if you're immunosuppressed, you're probably not going to uh, be working in uh, a critical care area. Um, yeah, we'll probably put them in, in precautions, but um, in general, you're not at risk. Uh, it's the patient that's immunosuppressed that's at risk. So here's some diagnostic studies, and I want to note that the top part of this slide is addressing uh, or asking you to look at table 1412, and that's uh, telling you to look at this, the fourth generation of um, uh, testing uh, for um, uh, antigen antibody testing. Um, so HIV progression is monitored by the CD4 plus T cell counts. Um, that gives us a marker of the immune function. And then it's also marked by viral load. So two different indicators. The lower the viral load, the less active the disease. If the viral load is so low that we can't detect it, great, good. They still have HIV. Um, it's good for them that we can't detect it, but they're never not going to have HIV. Once it's there, it's there. They're never going to be um, cured of HIV. Maybe one day, but not today. Um, diagnostic studies. We see abnormal blood tests. These are common. Um, this is caused by HIV and the opportunistic diseases that come along with it and the complications of therapy. Um, we are going to see decreased uh, WBC counts. We're going to see uh, low platelet counts. Um, we will see anemia associated with the ARTs, the antiretroviral therapies that they get, and we'll see altered liver functions. Um, resistance tests can help determine if a patient is resistant to um, uh, ARTs. So an assay will help the healthcare provider know which medications may be effective. The genotype and the phenotype assay are similar to culture and sensitivity testing uh, used for antibiotic sensitivity. So we are progressing with our treatment um, of HIV, and we're getting better at this. Um, we're getting better. This disease, um, when it hit this country, I was a... Um, I was in my first semester of nursing school, so that would have been 1984. Um, so here we are, what, 35, uh, 84, no, we're a good ways down the road. Um, uh, yeah. So we're going to monitor the disease progression the immune function, and we're going to manage symptoms for these patients. We're going to initiate and monitor the antiretroviral um, therapies that they need. Uh, we will prevent, detect, and or treat opportunistic infections. We're going to prevent and decrease complications of therapies. And we're going to prevent further transmission of HIV. Now, when we think about these things, think about the population that HIV um, usually strikes. Um, they're usually a poorer population, and especially in third world co countries, um, um, many of these people can't afford ART, um, are uneducated. But let's think in our country. Um, again, many of them can't afford um, ART. Um, many of them are living in a com community that um, uh, they're shunned or um, looked down upon because of their disease or because of their lifestyle or their choices. Um, so the things we do um, could be life and death um, for them. So we need to put aside um, our own um, ideas and do what we can and be professional for these people. So our interprofessional care uh, we do an initial patient visit. We do a baseline data. We establish a rapport with the patient. Um, we use patient input to develop a plan of care. We initiate teaching about the spectrum of HIV, the treatment, the prevention of transmission, improving health, and family planning. So the main goal is to decrease the viral load. 
um, we want to maintain or increase the CD4 plus T counts. We want to prevent HIV-related symptoms and opportunistic diseases. We want to de delay the disease progression, and we want to prevent HIV transmission. Um, some of the things we might look for is uh, we look at their over-the-counter medications because there are some huge um, drug interactions. Uh, herbal therapies like St. John wort, wort, St. John's wort, has uh, huge implications with the ART. Uh, so we look at their over-the-counter drugs, antacids, proton pump inhibitors, and supplements can have um, interactions with the ART. Um, so we look at their whole drug regimen and make sure that uh, uh, what they're taking doesn't counteract what we're trying to give them. We also need to impress upon them that it's important to stick to the timeline of their ARTs. These drugs need to be taken on time um, so that they're uh, completely covered and there's no uh, decrease in the plasma levels or the, the, the blood levels of their uh, drug therapy. Um, so when you do an assessment, there are no assumptions. Um, assess the risk. Blood transfusions uh, before 1985 were um, an avenue for HIV. I took care of a lady in the hospital who uh, turned up HIV positive, and she was, um, she was devastated. Well, she had had a baby and had a, um, a blood transfusion uh, during the delivery, and she came back HIV positive. Um, sharing needles is another um, uh, way to uh, acquire HIV. Sexual intercourse unprotected or with many partners. A history of sexually transmitted diseases is another indicator. Um, we assess diagnosed patients thoroughly. We look at their past health history. We again look at their medications. Uh, we look at functional health patterns. Uh, we'll, the presence of symptoms using a systematic review. We put all of this together and, and uh, do an assessment. And then we start our planning phase. Uh, we want to look at a plan that's going to provide compliance with a drug regimen. Um, we want them to adopt a healthy lifestyle. We want them to either find or stay in beneficial relationships. We want spiritual well-being in regard to life and death. And we also want to see coping with the disease and its treatments because this is going to be a lifelong process um, and it probably is going to be uh, leading to a premature death. Um, let's see, we want to make sure that we are protecting others from HIV, so there's a lot of education. Um, Um, we need to speak candidly. We need to be culturally sensitive. We need to use language that is appropriate. We need to give age-specific information and uh, talk about behavior-changing counsel, uh, counselor or counseling. When we talk about prevention of HIV, we talk about decreasing risks. <coughs> um, with sexual intercourse, we talk about abstinence, abstinence, no contact, safe sex, and use of barriers. And guys, you better get comfortable and be able to talk about these things because the day will come when you have to do this. Um, when it comes to drug use, um, don't use drugs. If you do, do not share equipment. A lot of um, places have come up with um, uh, exchange programs where you can take needles uh, to the health department and get needles, clean needles. Um, do not have sexual intercourse under the influence of any impairing systems, uh, substance. And also find a place uh, so that you can refer the patient for help with substance use. Um, perinatal transmission. Help the patient with family planning. Prevent HIV in women, that's important. And make sure that any pregnant woman has a, is appropriately medicated with HIV infect, uh, uh, ARTs because we know that that uh, infection rate goes down to less than 2% for a newborn if the uh, female is being, if the pregnant mom is uh, receiving treatment. Um, at work. 
we use standard precautions. We report all exposures for timely treatment and counseling. It's possible that we would use post-exposure prophylaxis with a combination of antiretroviral therapy, and this can significantly decrease the risk of infection. Testing is the only sure method of determining HIV infection. The CDC recommends universal voluntary testing as part of routine medical care. An estimated 14% of people living with HIV are not aware they are infected. And I always remember a gentleman that I took care of um, here in Nashville who uh, was very angry about um, having HIV. He had had multiple uh, uh, sexual partners. Uh, to this day, I'm not sure if they were male or female. Um, and I asked him if he had let his partners know. He, his response was no. Let them find out the way I found out. Um, so antiretroviral therapy, uh, it can be significantly, it can significantly slow HIV progression, but it's complex. It has side effects. It doesn't work for everyone, and it is expensive. So again, I go back to that population that actually has or is positive for HIV. Um, it's expensive if you don't have money or you don't have a job or either. You might not be able to afford it. Where do you go? Why do you think we know the statistics on untreated HIV? Um, assess the patient's readiness to start. Um, do we start this treatment when uh, the um, immunosuppression is the greatest? No, ideally we start it when we um, diagnose HIV, but for some people they can't afford to start that until um, the immunosuppression starts. So. Okay, um, we want the patient to uh, adhere to the drug regimen. This is critical. This is to prevent. Um, we want to prevent the viral load from increasing. We want uh, to prevent the attack on the CD4 plus uh, cells. We want the, to stop the disease progression. We want to prevent opportunistic diseases. Um, and we want to decrease viral drug resistance because that is one of the things that have been happening. The antiviral retroviral drugs that we've been using, um, HIV is starting, that virus is starting to get bold and learn how to work around some of the, vir uh, the drugs. Um, an individualized approach is the best approach, so it's not one treatment fits all. Um, as the disease progresses, progress, progresses um, we need to make sure they have adequate nutrition they're up to date on their vaccinations. Um, so that means flu vaccine, pneumonia vaccine, and they can get those at the same time. You need to get them when they're feeling good. Um, if they've got an opportunistic um, uh, something going on, maybe not at that time, but you know, come into the office and, and get your flu shot, get your pneumonia shot. Um, we want healthy habits. We want to avoid risky behaviors, and we want supportive relationships. Um, HIV infection, it has no cure. It continues for the rest of your life. It causes physical disability. It impairs social, emotional, economic, and spiritual well-being, and it ultimately leads to death. Um, we have to think about end-of-life care. Um, and for many people, um, especially in the early days of HIV, there was simply nobody um, that could provide end-of-life care. Um, many of these people were outcasts or um, their family had left them because of their lifestyles. So this was a sad day in, in humanity. All right, let's talk about some gerontological considerations. Um, the number of persons over age 60 living with HIV is anticipated to grow. It's growing already. Our baby boomers are coming of age. As a nurse, you need to be aware of the special health considerations of HIV-infected older adults. Um, they are susceptible to the same diseases, heart, cancer, diabetes, bone disease, arthritis, hypertension, kidney disease, cognitive impairment, as non-HIV infected older adults, but 
they may experience them at an older age. They may, may be at higher risk of comorbidities due to the effects of the medications to, um, of the HIV treatment, the ART. So um, another uh, thing that goes with this is that they will be practicing polypharmacy, taking multiple medications to, to treat a variety of conditions. So they're going to have the ART therapy. They're going to have hypertension therapy. They're going to have cardiac therapy. They're going to be a drugstore. They're going to have so many medication boxes, they won't know what to do. Well, all of these drugs have contraindications. Um, it might be difficult for older adults to get appropriate health care and support if they are ashamed and hesitate to tell anyone that they have HIV. Be aware of that. As a nurse, you need to recognize that HIV is a chronic disease that will affect an increasing number of older adults and be prepared to help the older person who is living with HIV. Um, all right, so my last slide is a very personal slide. And I want to show you, this is my uh, friend Joe Parker. Joe died about uh, probably four years ago. He was the man that hired me at Southern Hills Medical Center. He was my first boss here in Nashville. And then he rehired me about probably nine years ago. Um, Joe is probably my very favorite nurse, um, one of my mentors. And he is probably the most compassionate nurse that I have ever met in my life. Joe was a single man. Um, he had a lifestyle that um, many people would look at and say, that's not natural. Um, he was not HIV positive, nor did, uh, uh, well, he was not HIV positive. But his mission in life was to never let anybody die alone. And when I moved to Nashville, the AIDS epidemic was great in Nashville. He had many friends that were dying from AIDS, and his mission was to never let them die alone. He would um, bring them into his home, and he would provide um, shelter for them and uh, take care of them. He was a great man. Um, very compassionate. Um, he died of a, a stroke. Um, he was diabetic. He had had open heart surgery, and uh, he eventually stroked. But um, he was a good nurse. He was very compassionate, and I learned so much from him. And one of the things I learned is not to judge people. So, uh, Joe, this one's for you. <laughs>